I'm here with John Cropper. I'm so delighted to have you here. To me, you are a total visionary. And I wanted to invite you on this because you have this amazing capacity to sort of see around corners when it comes to zeitgeist. And I was so impressed with your background. And uh, this will just take a minute, but just for the audience to get a grip on where you've come from. Uh, you've most recently been working for Aston Martin as a person expanding their, their brand and their sort of image and, and uh, profile, but so many other luxury brands from Ralph Lauren and Zaha Hadid and Bugatti, and you were named the most successful marketer in the United States under the age of 40, I think, when you were working with the Infinity brand. But even before that, you worked with Quincy Jones uh, and MTV and in the music world. And, and I know that, you know, our focus is really on finance, but we're at such an interesting moment in history with all these new technologies happening in finance. But you're someone who's really been where the rubber hits the road when it comes to how the economy works, how things get sold, how brands make their presence known. And so these are the reasons I thought it would just be so interesting to hear your views about where the world is going now. Oh, amazing. Well, first of all, thank you so much for the kind introduction. Uh, I have had a remarkable journey, truly. Uh, and it really began uh, at MTV in the early 90s, where I had the opportunity to travel around the world studying youth culture, launching MTV channels in places like Asia, Latin America, living in South Africa for a year. And I think that the opportunity to understand how young people think, understanding aspiration, what their dreams are, and recognizing the commonalities wherever you are in the world amongst those things was uh, the foundation for my, my career. And then when I went to work with Quincy Jones at Warner Brothers, um, one of the greatest storytellers of all time, and uh, to get to sit next to him for a few years, um, as he's the Obi-Wan and I was Luke Skywalker in the training program, uh, I learned from him a couple of core philosophies that have transformed my life and I think are very important for any of us in the world of commerce. Um, and the first one is that his mission in life and the mission of the company was to inject optimism into culture. And I decided that that's what I wanted to do in my life as well. And I think that all of us that get to work on the bleeding edge of innovation have a responsibility to be optimists and to bring positivity into the culture. And the other key lesson learned from him was the power of a beautiful story. All value is based on story. All the value that we talk about in, uh, around future is based on what someone believes something will be worth, not what it is worth. And your belief in something is based on the elegance and the quality of the stories being told, the romanticism, the seduction. And so those were key Quincy Jones lessons. And then when I moved on into the marketing world and I ran the strategy group at Nissan, um, and we took that company from here to here in only a three or four year period, uh, based around a few core principles, led at the time by um, a now uh, quite controversial figure, Mr. Mr. Go, but he understood a few key elements that we embraced. The first one is beautiful design. You have to really invest in package. Well, looks do matter. And so the design and the packaging was a big part of it. Um, but where I really, I think, made a contribution revolved around this one idea that the best brands in the world out T part of it. Um, but where I really, I think, made a contribution revolved around this one idea that the best brands in the world out teach versus out sell. None of us are salespeople. We're all educators. Our job is to educate our customers about our product or is to educate people about, in the case, finance or the blockchain. The transactional stuff happens after, as a result of that. And real trust is formed when knowledge is shared in an authentic way. I'm trying to get a, um, a, a used car salesman to behave in a more respectful and elegant way was a huge cultural shift that I feel very proud of. Uh, and then moving on through the journey, I had the opportunity to spend time with uh, in big advertising agencies, running large global accounts and managing large teams. And, you know, at the end of all of that, the one key word that emerged is inspiration. How do we 
inject inspiration into the culture? How do we help people to realize that when, they're part, when we are part of their life, their life is better? And it has nothing to do with the collection of physical objects or material possession, although that is important. It has more to do with the belief that your dreams can become real. It's just that you need the right, the right support mechanisms around you. And the brands have, the, have a, an opportunity and a responsibility to deliver that. That was that. And then moving on into back into music with uh, Sean Combs, AKA P Diddy, AKA Puffy, AKA Puff Daddy, AKA Sean, uh, a man of many names, but of many talents. And um, probably the best marketing and salesperson I've ever met. And he understood that the basic core of it all is, is seduction and, and romanticism. Um, and all of those are kind of at this level of, in my professional career, foundational elements. And most recently, I uh, spent the last three years as the uh, innovation officer and head of partnerships for Aston Martin, uh, the brand of James Bond. And when I was a student in college, I had the Sean Connery poster on my wall with, you know, in the perfectly tailored suit against the DB5, and I dreamed of being James Bond. And uh, the next thing you know, I'm doing a million flight miles launching Aston Martin helicopters and submarines and yachts and 60-story buildings in Miami. And the idea that um, a brand isn't a thing or a service, a brand is an emotion. We don't sell machines, we sell the feeling that the machine creates. That's what it is. It's the visceral energy that the machine creates when you're driving it or you're flying in it or you're swimming in that beautiful pool or you know, going up, looking out over an expansive, stunning view. The feelings are what we're selling. And it really has been a dream to live on the bleeding edge of, uh, of innovation across all these different industries and now get to think about, um, how, in particular, how this new technology, uh, the blockchain, which is a meta-level concept, will impact all of these things. Well, exactly, and that's the thing. What you talked about belief. This is something I've been trying to emphasize. Money itself, it's not the piece of paper. It's the belief in the piece of paper. And the world seems to be split between DeFi, these, the crowd that gets that you can create a new belief system around money and, and it's real. And what I call the TradFi, the traditional finance crowd, mm -hmm. who I deal with all the time. And you know, I walk into rooms full of the most senior people in traditional finance. They don't know anything about what's happening in DeFi. It's like this weird thing over there they don't feel ne the need to be connected to. And their whole thing is, well, no one will do that because they won't believe in it. And I'm like, do you think the dollar is anything more than a belief system? <laughs> That's all it is. So, so I'm really fascinated your insights about beliefs and how the DeFi crowd is creating a belief system and what happens as we transition from one to the other, if you have any views on that. Mm. People used to say that no one would ever believe that you would put a food into a machine and it would heat it up in three minutes or that you would fly uh, from New York to London in two hours and 52 minutes on a supersonic aircraft, you know, uh, or that you would actually communicate with someone across the world holding a little device onto your head. And it, those are all things that we enjoy today that didn't seem possible, and many people didn't believe them and thought they were pure science fiction. I like to look at this through the lens of the luxury market, because most new innovations that we enjoy in the world today began with a small group of people who were the early adopters, the first ones to embrace it, try it out, experiment with it. In essence, the early investors in these new technologies that then causes that ripple in the pond effect and it ripples out to eventually reaching the masses. So if you take the cell phone as an example, the Motorola brick phone, which was this big, a giant block, it was about $5,000 for one, only investment bankers and diplomats and such, you know, had you know could have one of those. <laughs> and now we all have them. Um, I think about the Bugatti Veyron, which is a $3 million car. Only a few hundred of them were ever made. 
300 very wealthy individuals bought those cars. But that vehicle was nothing more than a research and development program for the Volkswagen Group, which owns it. And technology on that $3 million car is now available on a Passat or a, a, a mass market vehicle. So I don't see this as any different. This, this new emerging financial system, it, it starts with a small group of believers and visionaries who begin to experiment with it and demonstrate the possibilities of it and then it evolves and it expands over time. I don't see this technology as any different. And it's also really fascinating when you think about old technologies that were at the pinnacle of innovation that get displaced by a new technology, they re-emerge as luxury. The candle, a wax candle, at one point was the most advanced technology because people didn't have light after the sun went down. And then the uh, uh, gas lamp came along and then eventually Edison brought electrification. And that candle went away for a while. But I would rather have dinner with you by a uh, candle light than under a fl bright fluorescent light. Or the vinyl uh, album, vinyl record was a really advanced piece of technology, and now we have a digital age, and now vinyl records are at all time the love of that nostalgia. And I can, I can imagine a post, find post uh, um, I like to think about the future in terms of post-digital. What comes after all of this? Ooh, that's interesting. Elaborate on post-digital. What does that mean? Well, I think that we already, um, uh, in, and we'll come back to DeFi in a minute, but we're already in a sort of a post-digital concept where um, the opportunity to not have my phone on, uh, I'll pay a premium to go someplace that literally doesn't have a, um, a cell signal. I think of that as almost a post-digital kind of a reaction. Um, I, I'm very fascinated by what's happened um, in this global realignment driven by COVID and how we're rethinking and reorganizing the way our society is structured and functions. Right now, we're, high, we're in an aggressive digital expansion mode as many industries, including finance, are moving into uh, more digital distributed formats. Telemedicine in the medical sector is unbelievable what's the transformation that's occurred. The entire education sector shifted to online education in the last 18 months which was very upsetting and disruptive, but now people have become more and more comfortable with that, and obviously in finance. And so we're, we're in the middle of what I believe could be a cultural renaissance period similar to what occurred after the Black Plague or after some of the other pandemics in history. Usually there was this moment of ex massive expansion, creative expansion. And I think that's where we are right now. I think that that may be the... Uh, our 2022, 2023. Drew Rosner, who's been a real mentor, educator to me about this new form of finance. He helped me understand NFTs and this famous Bored Ape Yacht Club that everybody talks about, which for traditional finance people is like, what? Why are people paying like mm -hmm. almost a million bucks for a JPEG of a cartoon? Like, this is crazy. Mm. But once I sat with Drew, I understood, okay, what we're dealing with is these are collections of very bright people that are coming together with a mutual vested interest in the performance of the asset that they own, mm -hmm. which is this NFT. Mm -hmm. And then they're shifting luxury goods through these networks. And maybe you know a bit about what's happened with the Gucci Roblox deal mm -hmm. with Balenciaga is doing wonders with all this stuff. And and I kind of realized, oh my God, you know what this is? It's the end of the East India Company as a model mm -hmm. that we've had for 400 years. Because now when bright people want to come together to create value and profits and wealth, they may not need to incorporate anymore. Mm -hmm. They may not be able to use these new DeFi structures to achieve the same thing or better. Because the thing is with blockchain, in a way, so now you don't even need a lawyer anymore because there's no dispute, right? It's clear how the money should be allocated and mm -hmm. why and when. Mm. So, wow, what a revolutionary idea that we're gonna leave the East, East India Company model 
and enter a space with these new constructs, you, you stop being a equity holder and you start being a member. Mm-hmm. Like, this is a change. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the formation of communities instantly based on common interests is now truly, is truly achievable. You know, the NFT is interesting because it's to me not that different than the traditional physical art world, which is in essence a syndicate of wealthy people who will support and invest in a, in a physical asset as a group and drive the value of that object up because they have market making, market making ability in that, in that space. And I think the NFT is functioning very much in the same manner. I'll never forget years ago when I was working in Hollywood and I was at a dinner with a group of guys that called the Brotherhood of the Black Cloth. These were the top special effects gurus in Hollywood, and they worked behind these black bel velveteen cloths on the, on the set. So that's where they came up with this rather ominous name. And I was asking them, I said, you guys make the most powerful artwork I've ever seen, the special effects of the Matrix guy or whatever it may be. Those images are the defining images of our society those crazy special effects scenes. I was like, why isn't that being sold as art for $5 million or $50 million on a, on a screen in someone's home? And they said, the reason is because it's replicatable at 100% accuracy because it's a digital piece of content. Therefore, you can't achieve scarcity value one of one, which is the driver behind the art world or one of 10, let's say, whatever, a scarcity. The blockchain makes that one of one a reality now. A digital asset can be truly anchored and defined as a singular object, not replicatable or at least authentic in terms of um, uh, provenance. That's really quite breathtaking, and so now, I feel that the, the blockchain, um, one, it, trans, it represents a new form of community. It represents a new form of power structure. I can imagine entirely new political systems, uh, political parties emerging based on the transparency and protection that this kind of a new um, mechanism allows for. But ultimately, it's about trust. It's about transparency. And it's, it's about authorship. And I think that that means empowerment for people who have traditionally been disenfranchised, women, people of color, lower income people. Now you get to actually have authorship of your idea. Like your idea doesn't just get lifted in, out of the ether as it, as it does today. That's really exciting. And so, you know, it's, 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 it is rather, um, uh, it's a rather compelling moment in time because it, it does feel like a, uh, a birth of an entirely new type of not just economic structure or system, but also a societal system in terms of the way that we organize uh, around ideas and, and, and concepts. Yeah, I feel this too, and it's, it's reflected in so many interesting ways. Like one of them is some people still have a business card, but some people now have a QR code. And the difference is people with a business card are still in a world where you have one job, one job title with a physical address, and, and that's what you do. Your identity is on that business card. But what I'm finding is switched on, bright, dynamic people, no one is working like this anymore, mm -hmm. particularly post-COVID. Mm -hmm. Now they have a portfolio of different undertakings. They... Um, when you say, what do you do? It's like, they'll define it depending on what your interests are. So they'll find a point of commonality, but they may be doing like five different things that are seemingly unrelated. And that's why they give you a QR code that directs you to the right you know, set of interests. And it's almost like humans are fractionalizing themselves mm -hmm. because money is also allowing this to happen. And so that's just a super interesting concept of how to your point, it's going to change how we all work. Mm. It's going to actually mean the end of LinkedIn because LinkedIn is all about one job, one job title, then the next job with one job title, then the next job. 
But now if we're working in this portfolio way with a variety of activities and interests, mm. and you're not, like I said, an employee all the time, you're maybe a member, this is a radically different world. Very exciting. Well, I think that the, the, um, the, clo the COVID lockdown uh, forced maybe a 10 year acceleration of trends that were already happening. The idea that we work and live at home isn't a new idea, or the gig economy, that, these are new ideas. But this um, biological pandemic forced a, a total reorganization the way we think. In Hollywood, going back to another Hollywood reference, um, we used to say, if you're not a double hyphenate, then you've got to tighten your, your skills up, which means you are a writer, director, producer. Which means you have two hyphens in your title, which means you're good at three things, and you get paid three times. <laughs> And so you want to be a, at least a double hyphenate in, in, in that business. But I think in, in our society, you want to be a double hyphenate generally. And millennial, uh, millennial, I hate putting like these tags on people, buckets of people, but we'll say the youth market fundamentally understand that and have a desire to be liberated and not be forced into um, uh, definition based on historical dogma, you know, and old school kind of notions of, of what is to be productive. And I think that the blockchain, again, is going to only help and enable and accelerate that, that transformation in, in the, way that we, um, that we, the way that we think about ourselves. Again, we're more liberated when you, when you have uh, a sense of authorship over your work because you can authenticate it. You can form a community around rapidly around your idea through, through these, new, these new mechanisms. Social media, for better or worse, allows us to broadcast to larger numbers of people. Individuals have more power now than they ever had to be able to communicate their ideas. And we now have the ability you know, to um, manage the financial transaction underpinning all of that. And so I think that we're entering into an incredible um, entrepreneurial kind of um, liberating experience. And I think that the banks and the financial, in, the financial services sector are going to, um, there's going to be brain matter splattered all over the walls in the boardrooms of these institutions as they start to feel the pain that's going to come from, you know, a group of people in one town saying, you know what, I don't like the, I don't like the way that bank treated me on my mortgage. I'm going to start my own entity and round up a whole little, little like-minded crew and we're going to invest together. Or, you know, um, it was fascinating spending time in China and, and, and studying um, group buying where groups would, you know, people needed a new uh, washing machine or a new appliance. They would go, um, round up 20 friends who all needed a new washing machine. They'd go in there and basically like, you know, like we're a mob here. We're, we need the washing machine. We want it at 20% off, take it or leave it. And you know, strength in numbers, purchasing power that we all understand when you operate at a big institutional level, we understand purchasing power and the negotiating um, leverage it provides when you're buying in bulk. But now, Individuals can assemble teams around their around them and achieve bulk kind of purchasing, and, and I think the blockchain is another uh, platform that will help to enable those kinds of transactions. So, what does that mean? Um, you know, so we could go on and on and on about you know the the possibilities and what this new type of um, I'll call it enablement and uh, authorship uh, platform allow, um, but it's going to be absolutely extraordinary. And I can't wait to see what happens in political, in the, in the realm of politics in a decade from now as well. Because the, the way that elections work and the way that power is acquired through the mass seduction of audiences in the realm of what we call votes, that whole thing is going to be radically impacted by this as well, in my view. Yeah. The architecture of influence will be shifting fundamentally. Totally, totally. In fact, on that, uh, you know, things are happening now that are so striking. This thing that Donald Trump has created, a SPAC, and this SPAC looks on track to 
probably hit something like 10 billion by the time we get to the next election. And what's he done it for? To create his own social media platform. And so every time he goes on it, it doesn't count under the Federal Election Commission rules as political advertising time because it's just a live interview. And basically he makes money from show. I'm, you can see it coming. It's going to be from reality TV to, um, and it'll probably have more nudity than the Game of Thrones, right? <laughs> like, you know, like it changes the whole landscape of politics. So when I speak to politicians and I go, do you get what this means? Like you're, you're raising money under the old rules. That is a fraction of this kind of money. And you are all tied up in all the, of the restraints of the law. He's just busted out of this and created something new. Now, whether you like Donald Trump or not, is not the point. The point is there's an innovation in finance. Yes that's been created here, that it has totally shifted the playing field of mm -hmm. politics. The fundamental challenge facing American democracy is how the media and its role in the distribution of information has been fundamentally corrupted. You used to have to give an oath, like, um, uh, like a doctor has to give an oath that they will do their best to save your life. And there was an oath as a journalist that said, you're going to do your best to pursue the truth, objective. And not like in, uh, unlike many other countries, the industry of information and truth gathering somehow became politicized where it was okay to be subjective. And now in this country, we've got two different communications ecosystems based on political perspective and agenda. You know, we'll say with like the MSNBC, you know, versus the Fox kind of thing. That fundamental schism is causing such divisiveness. Uh, and I'm really, really concerned about that. Now, Donald Trump um, is a media entrepreneur, a media figure, just like me. He comes from television and understands storytelling, and he understands the value of cost per thousand, CPMs, you, you know, and advertising, uh, uh, attracting advertisers, demographics, et cetera. I read the investor deck for his new thing just you last did. night. Yeah, I'll say it to you. <laughs> Truth social. Yes. The idea that the political power of the future is a media influencer by controlling their own media platform, that, that's a spooky and scary reality. Now, you look at the Berlusconis in Italy and you look at the, even in the, uh, the Putins in Russia, they all understand that the first step when uh, aggregating power is to control the communications platforms, which allows you to control the seductiveness of the stories being told. And obviously, mas massage what is truth. So what does our future look like when anyone who's running for political office isn't going door to door asking for $10 donations, but is trying to create a media spectacle around themselves and their policies and their concepts? It means that the, the merger of entertainment and reality will only amplify. That's where we're headed. Very upsetting, because increasingly it's not about the quality of the, uh, of the, of the brain and the elegance of the thinking and the, intellect, the intellectual debate. It's about, am I more stylish than you? Do I deliver my message with a little more swagger than you do? do, do um, am I good looking? Um, am I controversial? It has almost nothing to do with, are my ideas fundamentally going to help transform the society for the better? And I feel that we in the innovation business and in this business of, of distributed knowledge and um, in and, and, and the world of blockchain, we have to be thinking about some of these broader societal challenges and how we as entrepreneurs can uh, um, develop ideas that are both profit, profitable and purposeful.
positive and purposeful. You know, and I'm not saying that you have to sacrifice profit to do well or do good. You know, they, those things coexist. You know, but I think that we're heading into some pretty scary and scary days as it relates to um, what Norman Mailer coined the industrial production of fame. Yes, absolutely. It reminds me of uh, what the guy I think is the greatest philosopher of our time now, a fellow called Daniel Schmuchtenberger. Mm. I don't know if you know him, but he, he's got a marvelous series of videos, uh, one on YouTube called The War on Sense Making. Mm. And he talks about basically the hygiene of the information ecology, mm. that, that, that our hygiene of the information ecology has become weakened. And it's funny, actually, what you said about... Um, I'm more stylish or I can deliver it more beautifully than the next person. I remember working for President George W. Bush and I was with him on the first day that he did a press conference. He did not do that well on that first day. And he's kind of famous for having this sort of slightly bumbling, you know, ah shucks, I don't know, it's complicated type of style. But having worked closely with him, I, I, I remember having a conversation, being in a conversation with him where he talked about the lack of polish in his delivery. And he said, listen guys, I could get media training. I could spend some of my time moving up the polish curve. And some of the previous presidents had done exactly that because even, even Bill Clinton, when you look at his first press conference, he was also kind of bumbling in that first thing. By the way, I challenge anybody to do your first press conference as president of the United States and be completely cool about it. Yeah, right. But nonetheless, it was interesting. He understood the trade off and he's like, you know, either my ideas stand or they don't. And spending time trying to make them more beautiful and polished because we're in a camera television era, is that really good use of time? But now, because of all these developments you're talking about, personal brand is everything. Mm -hmm. And that ability to build trust is more and more based on how beautifully do you deliver it? So this is really interesting. How do we manage that? and not have the information ecology continue to deteriorate. Right. That's going to be the fundamental challenge of the, of the next two decades, if we don't implode on ourselves before that. Um, I think that it starts with the youth. Um, I was em emboldened and I felt encouraged to see the political science has grown in, as a, a, a major, a, a declared major international affairs and political science are more popular than they were a few years ago. Journalism school applications actually were up, which startled me. I was like, what? It's not because they want to necessarily be journalists. They want to be Arianna Huffington or Nick Denton. They want to be um, media entrepreneurs, not so much journalists in my, in my view. But I was encouraged to see that there's a growing interest in among the youth market and um, uh, uh, political science and how we can, or how they can get involved and help to, uh, I'll say, swing the pendulum. Um, this is a bipolar nation. We swing all the way from, um, you know, a Dick Cheney, um, a Bush mindset, all the way to an Obama mindset, and then all the way to a Donald Trump mindset, and then who knows where it's going to swing back to from there. And if you were married to someone who behaved that way, you wouldn't be married to them for long. If their attitudes and their perspectives culturally shifted that widely. And so I think that that represents um, kind of a, a fundamental turning point culturally. But when I think about individual branding, um, I wrote a book, it's called Seduction. And I tried to distill it down into nine steps. Like, what are the nine steps cool. to what manufacture? Cool, are the nine steps? <laughs> so the seduction stands for each letter as a chapter. So the first step is the letter S, which is self-definition and self-awareness. There's no way that any of us can be purposeful or meaningful or be great contributors to society or even in our own relationships, family, um, romantically, whatever, if we don't have clarity in our own self-definitions. So that's step one. The letter E is environment, understanding the cultural context you have to operate in. And that means being a great listener. But it really means being having a kind of finely tuned radar to what culture what's happening. The D stands for design. 
you have to be packaged well. This could be a political candidate or an automobile. The you understanding, that means being a great listener and understanding the people that you're trying to build a relationship with. C stands for communication, the quality of the storytelling, the, 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 the poetry. The T stands for trust, which means you have to do what you say. And if you waver from that, then you've lost. So trust. The I stands for inspiration. Great brands and great people inspire others. The O stands for openness, which is about generosity and the willingness to give until it hurts. You have to be someone who's, who um, is more concerned with how you can project good ideas, positive support, then, then take it because it will come back to you in spades anyway. And then the N finally stands for network, which is you can have all these great qualities and characteristics, but if no one knows about it, then you're just uh, screaming out in the middle of a desert somewhere. Um, and so the N stands for the network and building, building a community around those first eight. And so that has worked out to be like a mathematical equation. If you follow those nine steps and understand them really well and put real thought into each one, it works out like math. It, it just is a formula that works, you know? And so I'm not sure how we got onto that. Well, but. you know, actually it reminds me of is Bitcoin. I mean, in a way it's, it has seduced the world and so beautifully like this mysterious founder mm -hmm. who appears at one moment and never seen again mm -hmm. other people who might be that founder you saw the court yeah. case recently yeah. where the guy won in australia um it's got this it, it fits all of the things yeah. you're talking about people trust it people trust it so this is back to the story and i think Finance traditionally is not good at storytelling. And mm. I remember watching a video of yours where you talked about, imagine if financial services could work out storytelling. Mm. Now, why is it that traditional financial services or generally the finance space doesn't tell their story well, or maybe ideas about how could they tell the story mm. better? Well, that was what we were talking about before earlier. Uh, these are institutions that have acquired power through veiled behaviors. You, you, it's, uh, it's all about kind of privacy. And I think that it's not uh, culturally um, almost appropriate to have a, a transparent, open narrative in that kind of um, environment. So I think that there's something about that around the history and the, this idea of privacy and secrecy, and you don't want to tell your stories. You just want to, only for people who know, kind of thing. I think that's part of it. I think the other piece to it is um, that, that the sector uh, generates an enormous amount of wealth for the individuals that work in those sectors. And um, unfortunately, a lot of the motivation for why people choose to go in that space isn't based on anything other than they've been completely seduced by people like me who help them, they actually believe that the, uh, you know, the Aston Martins and the, you know, and the $20,000 Hermes Birkin bag somehow make them more um, attractive. Yeah. You know, actually, and, and, and so I think that that's a space that, you know, I hate to make such a broad generalization, it's terribly unfair. Um, but I think that the, that the industry at, at its core, um, and this is shifting, by the way, I think BlackRock and a lot of the work that's happening, um, you know, around uh, sustainability and uh, conscious capital and investing into things that are going to have societal benefit, that is a movement that is definitely taking hold. And I think that that's really, you know, really um, powerful and when people realize that there's a lot of profit to be had in, in investing in things that actually are helpful. Totally. Well, you know, I'm working in a, in a VC where that's exactly it. We're totally driven by an ethos and we're only working with startups that are genuinely trying to do good things either for the planet or for people. Um, they're trying to solve the meta problems of our time, which is, you know, how do we get enough clean water to people, you know, and things. Um, 
we have an interesting company uh, we're working with that has developed a technology that allows you to purify, desalinate the worst water on the planet. Um, and the owner has said, the one thing I don't want to do is sell it to the majors because I don't want people being charged for clean water. I want to give clean water to everybody on the planet. Now, the VCs normally would be like, Ben, we don't want to work with this guy because the exit is gone. We're like, we would like to help you actually get clean water to every person on the planet. And the support for this is huge, this sort of ethos driven. And I think, again, blockchain is going to be hugely instrumental because now you won't have to well, there are a bunch of things that happen. One is you don't have to guess anymore. You'll be able to see the provenance of work, of objects, and know who built it where, how much were they paid, you know, what living conditions do they have. And I think consumers are going to get way more focused on how exactly was this made? Mm -hmm. Who was behind it? Who benefits from my purchase of right. it? Don't you well, think? It's, it, absolutely. It's just like the labels on food today, and it shows, well, here's the calories and here's what's in this food. Um, uh, it, in the future, products will have their social impact label, and it'll show how many, um, what would the supply chain impact. Um, I can imagine the, you know, the products of the future that are really popular. You can look at the label and say, oh, man, these guys are doing, aren't doing so well, and I think I'm going to take the competitor. And so... Um, uh, that's uh, part of a, I, can, I think, a branding philosophy that will begin to take hold. For me, also, it was the emergence of Kickstarter and the, and the crowdfunding, where you have an idea, you don't have access to a venture capitalist in Silicon Valley and you know those kind of scary conservative um, funding sources that typically will aren't going to be interested in in this kind of a thing. And now you have a platform and you can write, round up a hundred of your friends or a hundred people or a thousand or a million people. They all contribute to make something possible. That's a democracy. That, that's incredibly romantic. And I think that's part of what the blockchain will enable, uh, but even in a, in a more um, accelerated and scalable way because you can keep track and there's a ledger and there's, there's again, transparency around it. So, and that's a relatively new phenomenon. Yeah. You know, like the idea of crowdfunding is maybe 12, 15 years old. I, I crowdfunded my first book on economics in mm. 2015, mm. and nobody had crowdfunded a nonfiction economics book before. Mm -hmm. But I thought, well, you know, it's a new technology, and I always think it's fun to try to use the new technologies. But at the time, you know, I had, you know, been a advisor to a president and I'd, you know, run strategy for some big investment banks. And they were like, but you're an unknown author, the publishers. They, and so they didn't want to go anywhere near it. And I'm like, this is crazy. You know, there's a story to tell. And uh, anyway, I did it on crowdfunding. It was hugely successful. Hmm. And I actually made more money crowdfunding it than I ever would have made had I had a publisher. Mm -hmm. And that kind of tells you the publishing model is totally broken. Oh, abs absolutely. Yeah. They're, they're, they're gasping for oxygen right now, trying to figure out what to, to do. Their businesses are built, built on an old school idea called anointment. <laughs> yeah. You get tapped on both shoulders by the queen and now you've been knighted. Well, those brands will tap you and you can say that you were published by one of those big publishing houses and you might only sell a couple thousand copies, but you now can go on to, to some other income generating uh, opportunity because you were anointed. Well, I'd rather be anointed by the crowd. <laughs> I think that those guys are cool, the crowd's cooler. What's your view then on the whole cancel culture? Because that's kind of the dark side of this phenomena. If we're afraid to share an idea or an opinion because we're using the wrong terms, the wrong language, and therefore we sound whatever, politically incorrect or what have you, and now I'm unable to engage in a conversation or have a dialogue, then we'll never move forward. It's like conflict resolution where you can't have a two-way discussion. I, I'm deep, deeply troubled by it. I think that... Um, you know, when I was, uh, I remember when Dave Chappelle even, when, you know, on the most recently, and he, he made these comments uh, about the transsexual community and got really, you know, blasted. And 
I thought that a comedian's job is supposed to say things that are uncomfortable for the rest of us to say. And then we can have a chuckle about it and then we, can, we talk about it amongst ourselves. Like, I thought that was the whole point. You know, as, as a black American, um, you know, going through George Floyd, Black Lives Matter, um, uh, the, the, the loss of uh, even uh, Chadwick Boseman, the only black superhero, I think, you know, I'm like, um, and how polarized and challenged our, our culture is, at least in the United States, but also in other countries. We're never going to get to a place where we can have a sense of reconciliation and a sense of calm if we can't have a conversation, you know. So, yeah, I'm, I'm deeply troubled by it. I'm not sure. I haven't cooked up a... I haven't cooked up a solution to that one, Jess, yet, yet. (laughs) but working on it. (laughs) Well, good, good. Well, actually, I have an even bigger, trickier problem that you and I have talked about before. I'll I'll dive into now. It's it's another sort of meta problem of our time. Cyber. Yeah, I was going to get into strategic security and cyber. That's exactly right. So um, speaking of language and not being able to say something. So I've recently written a piece, two pieces, one we're already in World War III. Mm-hmm. And one was called, because um, people ask me, are we in a new Cold War? And my answer is, we're in a hot war in cold places. Yes. And the cold places are space war. We see all these articles about satellites, you know, mm-hmm. satellite warfare basically occurring mm-hmm. between all the superpowers. Mm-hmm. Um, it's also occurring cold places like in the open oceans. Uh, incidents involving American nuclear submarines and in the South China Sea. Mm -hmm. These are cold places. Mm -hmm. But cyberspace, I always think of as a cold place, too, Mm -hmm. in the sense it doesn't have any warmth to it. And I know you've been all over cyber. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, let's talk a bit about Mm. this very tricky issue of Um. are we in a new era of superpower conflict? And what does that look like? I mean, we could talk all day on that we can. one. <laughs> yes, answer is yes. We're in the we're we're in the middle of, um, or I'd say, in the formative stages of a conflict that could take us all down. I think that the Cuban Missile Crisis pales in comparison to what this can be. By the way, did you see that the Deputy Foreign Minister of Russia has just compared it to the Cuban Missile Crisis mm. and said we are on the brink on the because precipice. of what's happening in Ukraine? Yes. Well, so let's talk about it first at one level, which is we'll say at the consumer and institutional industrial level, and then we'll move into the geopolitical level. So. There is no way possible for any brand or institution to build trust with a group of customers if, they're not, if their information isn't secure. People have short memories. We have already forgotten about Volkswagen and how they corrupted their, you know, and Toyota had problems with a lot of these companies, um, and they still function quite, quite well today. But when these large companies increasingly get breached, and people's personal information. Uh, the healthcare sector is, is the number one um, attacked sector from, from, from a r- ransomware point of view. When someone's information is compromised, how am I supposed to trust the bank that I'm with or target who I shop with or whomever? So I think that um, the increasing uh, velocity of 